And okay, good. All right, and let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, chapter nine. And what we're going to be doing now in chapter nine, leveraging off of chapter eight, we had talked about the budgeting process, right? And remember, we said that we have the budget so that we could sit there and evaluate against the budget as to how our performance went, right? So we established the budget as a baseline, and then we're going to go and we're going to put that plan in place. function of course right while I'm trying to do something. Hang on a minute. That's working. Okay. Back to you. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at, I have no idea why it wasn't working. What we're going to be looking at here is this process where, ugh, get that thing out of the way, is this process where we will have our performance report, we'll have our budget that we've established, that's what we learned in Chapter 8, we'll set up our operating budget, and then we will compare our budget to the actual performance. As a result, we will come up with variance analysis. We're going to see how our budgeted results differ from our actual results. Based on that, we will go ahead and raise questions. What was causing this? Were we paying too much from our, our materials? Were we using too much materials? Whatever it was, identify the root causes of that, take corrective actions, and then go ahead and implement whatever corrective actions to that next period. We'll have the actual results. We'll compare that to our budget. And we will create a continuous improvement process by uh, going in sort of this circular fashion. And hopefully, we'll get better and better in our efficiency of our operations, effectiveness, efficiency of our operations. Okay. Now, we will prepare something called a a uh, flexible budget eventually. And the reason we're going to have to prepare a flexible budget is because when we prepare our planning budget, we will assume that we're going to have a certain level of activity. But the actual level of activity will be different than that planned level of activity. So what we'll do is we'll be able to adjust our budget for our actual level of activity, and then we will be able to prepare, uh, uh, compare, I should say, apples to apples instead of apples to oranges, essentially. Okay, So flexible budgets allow us to do that. And with a flexible budget, we go ahead and adjust our budget accordingly for different potential levels of activity. Okay, So we're just going to illustrate this with this kind of silly little example, this Larry's lawn service. And uh, Larry assumes that he's going to mow 500 lawns. And so he goes ahead and sets up his budget, what his revenue should be, what his expenses should be if he were to sit there and mow 500 lawns. Okay, So you take a look, and he's charging $75 per lawn. You take the 500, that's the Q, 500 times the 75. So he's planning for the month of June to have revenue of 37500 then he starts to look at his expenses, okay? Some expenses are fixed, okay? So I guess he has some fixed wages and salaries. I don't know, maybe he's paying a manager $5,000 a month or whatever. But then he also has some variable wages and salaries. This is probably what he's paying individuals for however many lawns they mow or whatever. So for the 30, we take the 500 times the 30. So if you have 500 times 30, that's 15,000 plus the 5,000 fixed. 
that gives us this $20,000 for salaries and wages. Notice the gasoline and supplies are all variable, right? If you don't mow a lawn, you don't use any gasoline. So he takes the $9 times the 500 lawns. That should be around 4,500 bucks and so on as he prepares this budget, assuming a level of activity of 500 lawns, right? Okay. Now you come over and let's say he actually mows 550 lawns. Well, we're going to have different numbers than what we had when we assumed what? 500 lawns and so we're going to see that when we go and compare that yes it's true for example that the what that the revenue variance was favorable of course it was favorable he more mowed more lawns didn't he so does that mean that he charged the right amount per lawn or is it just the number of lawns that he mowed that's driving this favorable variance you look at the wages the salaries here and you look at the gasoline and these U's mean unfavorable and it's showing that he spent more than he planned, right? But he should have spent more than he planned because he mowed more lawns. So we don't know at this point is he may be spending too much money or is it just the fact that he did what? Mowed more lawns, okay? So what we do is we go ahead and we create a flexible budget. That's what this guy is deciding to do. See, flexible budget. He's even flexing here. Okay, so we prepare a flexible budget. And with a flexible budget, we will go ahead and show what our activity levels were actually, okay? So instead of sitting here and comparing 550 to 500, we will see what our budget should have been if we put 550 lawns both in our flexible budget and of course compare that to our actual results. So now what happens? Now we go ahead and we take the 550 times the 75. That gives us 41,250. The 550 lawns, the number of lawns he actually mowed times what times the seventy five dollars that he's supposed to be charging per lawn and he's saying hey i should have had revenue of forty one thousand two fifty for five fifty lawns but i did make what forty three thousand so this is a true favorable isn't it okay so what happens this will start to bring the analysis to say well why is this favorable what happened and let's just do a quick analysis on this you sit here and you take this, uh, I guess I should write on this slide itself so everyone that's watching, so those watching at home can see what I'm doing, okay? And so what happens, I sit here and I take this uh, uh, 43,000 is his actual revenue. Just picking up that number. And I divide that by what? The actual number of lawns is 550. And when I do that math, I get what? Calculators. $78.18, you say? Okay, great. Thank you. So $78.18 is what they actually were charging per lawn, right? So we start to look at that, let's say, and we say, hey, hey, hey. How was it that we were able to charge $78.18 per lawn when we we're priced at $75 per lawn? And we ask a few questions there around the break room or whatever. I don't know. We call a meeting, a team meeting, and we say, how did that work? And somebody says, oh, you know, when I go to a lawn, when I go to do the lawn for somebody, I always ask them if they would like me to trim their roses or their other plants or whatever and when I do I say sure I'll charge you you know two or three bucks more five bucks more for that whatever we say oh really and people are receptive to that oh yeah they love it when I knock on the door and say hey I'm about done was there anything else you needed for me to do around here right and so what happens we start to implement the policy then that when you go and you finish mowing the lawn for the customer or whatever you knock on the door check with them and see if there's any additional we might raise some more revenue that way right so what's happening? We're improving our sales activities by what? By the results of this budget here, aren't we? Okay. 
Okay, so that's the point here of these flexible budgets is it gives us better information to understand, hey, is this truly favorable? Is it just that it's a different level of activity? Ah, yes, it is truly favorable. What are we doing that's helping us to enhance our revenue here? Okay, now you take a look at the spending variances and we see a couple here that are unfavorable. Now you look at this gasoline and supplies and we're supposed to be getting what? Uh, we're supposed to be, for gasoline and supplies, spending $9 per lawn. Isn't that what we're supposed to be spending? And if we did that using the flexible budget at 550 lawns, we should have only spent 4950 Instead, they actually spent what? 5100 So this truly is an unfavorable outcome, isn't it? Okay, at 55, at uh, 550 lawns, I should have only been spending 4950 I'm spending 5100 So I take that 5100 and I go ahead and I divide it by the 550 lawns. And when I take 5100 and divide it by the 550 lawns, I get calculators. Nine, nine what? 927. Okay, so we're spending too much on gasoline and supplies per lawn, aren't we? How much were we supposed to spend? How much were we supposed to spend? Huh? We were supposed to spend nine dollars. It should have only been forty-nine fifty. Instead, it was fifty-one hundred. It was what nine dollars and twenty-seven cents per lawn. We spent too much per lawn, didn't we? Now, did we spend too much per lawn because our guys that mow the lawns or people that mow the lawns are going to Chevron instead of Rotten Robbie? You guys know Rotten. You guys don't have Rotten Robbie out here? Okay, all the Hayward people are going, yeah, oh, yeah, Rotten Robbie, got it, yeah, okay, that's the cheap gas, okay, cheapo gas, they're going to cheapo gas, they're supposed to go to cheapo gas, we don't need premium gas, whatever, instead they're going to what, Chevron for their gas and getting them more expensive gas, maybe that's what's causing this, they're paying too much per gallon for the gas, or maybe, maybe when the person goes to fill up the gas can for the lawnmower, they also take a little for their own vehicle at the same time, right? Do we know exactly which it is? We don't know by this. We just know that something's wrong, right? Okay. So the reason that I'm spending so little time with Chapter 9 is that this analysis that you're seeing here is very rudimentary, very basic, is not going to tell you much about what's actually going on that's causing this. We need to get deeper into this to see is it a price problem or is it a quantity problem? Are we using too much gas per lawn or are we paying too much per gallon, right, for the gas? Okay, and that's what we're going to start to analyze here as we get into chapter 10. Okay, all right, so that being the case, that's all I want to say about chapter 9. Okay, so let's go ahead and end that. And I'll discard it. And let's find... Chapter 10. One of these is chapter 10. I think it's... No. Close that. I'll just do it the easy way. Get it off of iLearn. So here, search for it. Okay, so what we're going to do in Chapter 10 is start to understand 
how we can take those variances from the budget and break them into price and quantity components that will allow us to better understand is our problem that we're paying too much or is the problem that we're using too much of a particular um, factor, whatever it is, whether it's materials, whether it's labor, or whether it is um, overhead. Okay, so we always look at our three factors. Okay, and uh, so let's just go ahead and put this in slideshow. I thought I did. Okay, and let's just take a look. So again, we have this uh, variance here, and we're trying to get behind what? We're trying to get behind whether it is a price issue or a quantity issue. So what we will do is we will come up with price standards and quantity standards, and then we will slice our actual results by their price components versus their quantity components and we'll be able to tell you specifically the effect of price, the effect of quantity. Okay. When we do this, we will do this for our materials. We'll have a price and a quantity variance for our materials. We will do this for our labor, although when we get to labor we call it rate and efficiency, rate being price, efficiency being like quantity. And we will do it for our overhead. So we take the three uh, you know, product costs, and we break them up by price and by quantity. Okay. Now we have a standard price card in which we will enter information at a standard price for our materials, our labor, and our overhead. And then, of course, we will compare our uh, budget to our actual. Okay. Now, we will come over and we're going to focus on the spending variances more than the revenue variances. So we're focusing more down here with the spending than we are with the revenue. Okay, these are spending variances. Okay, now we come over and we will do our price variance. We will do our quantity variances. Again, we will do them for first materials, then labor, then overhead. That's where we're going. Okay, so let's just go ahead. And let's do this example here. And you've got this company that is sitting there, and they are preparing these parkas, whatever it is. And we're going to calculate a price variance for these guys, and we're going to calculate a quantity variance. Okay. Now, when we go ahead and do our price variances and our quantity variances, we're going to have to use some very specific formula that I am going to put up here on the board. Okay. And so the formula that we will use for materials and we're going to have what? Price. We're going to have quantity. Okay, price is going to be our actual quantity for the period. What was the actual quantity of materials we used? And it's going to be standard price minus the actual price. Okay, to get our price variance, we will take our actual quantity, we'll multiply it by our standard price minus our actual price. When we do our quantity variance, it will be our standard price And it'll be standard price, and it'll be times our standard quantity minus our actual quantity. 
okay? Now, we will have to use these formula. You will use these formula on the exam, okay? For the price, it'll be what? It'll be our actual quantity, and we will multiply that by the difference between our standard price minus our actual price. For the quantity variance, it'll be standard price, and we will multiply that by our standard quantity minus our actual quantity. Okay, These are the formula that we will use. We'll set them up like this, and uh, I will give you these formula on your exam. Okay, So what I will do is I'll put these formula in the header of the exam so that it will print on each page so that you can see it there at the top of each page as you go through and work these problems. So you don't have to memorize these formula. You obviously have to know how to use them though, right? Okay. So with that in mind, let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this first example. And we've got this Glacier Peak Outfitters has the following direct material standard for fiber fill in its mountain parka. And they are supposed to use, the budget is that they will use 0.1 kilograms of fiber fill per parka. And they are supposed to pay $5 per kilogram. Okay. Now the actual situation is that they use 210 kilograms of fiber fill they were purchased and used to make 2,000 parkas and the materials actually cost them 1,029. And you can see that I've put at the bottom of the page here the same formula that I just wrote up on the board, which is what? For price variance, and I've abbreviated here, AQ is actual quantity and it's going to be multiplied by the standard price minus the actual price, right? Okay, so we go ahead and we take our price variance first, and the actual quantity was what? 210? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take that 210. I'll just write it here so that I can show it on the screen. 210, and I'm going to multiply that by the standard price minus the actual price. Now, the standard price they gave me is five dollars isn't that what they're supposed to use okay per kilogram whatever of this fiber fill and instead they paid what and this is where you have to do a calculation for this you take this 1029 and you divide it by the actual amount that they purchased which was what 210 kilograms so you take the 1,290, you divide that, you divide that by 210, and you get what? What? 490. Okay, I don't know why you keep saying 4.9. It's $4.90. These are dollars. So you can say that if you want, but I just wanted you to know that it's dollars, right? I mean, you don't go to the store and say, oh, how much is this, 4.9? You say it's 490, right? Okay, just so you know, it's dollars though. Okay, so we take what? We take the 210 and we multiply it by a what? 10 cent difference? Okay, and so what happens? I'm sitting here and I would have a $21 variance, right? Now, is that, is that favorable or unfavorable? Well, the number is positive, isn't it? Is the number positive? Yeah. And so it's the numbers turned out positive. I think positive things are favorable, aren't they? I'm putting an F there. That's not a grade. That is what? That's saying it's favorable. And the number was positive, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. So what happened? When you look back now at this formula, notice I put the standard first. I put the standard first so that if my actual is what? more than my standard, the number will come out negative, and a negative thing is unfavorable, meaning I spent too much for this stuff, didn't I? But here you can see that what? The standard, I was I had budgeted for $5 a pop, and what? I'm only spending $4.90. So this is a good thing. This is favorable, and the number comes out positive if the standard is what? Bigger than the actual, right? Because this means I spent less than what I was planning to. When the actual is less than the standard? Right? 
okay now I'm just trying to analyze the price right and the impact of the price so I multiply it times the actual quantity so I can see what the full multiplied impact was of the fact that I'm paying what less per kilogram for this stuff and the full impact is a $21 favorable variance right right I look at what I actually purchased what I actually use and that is now telling me what this is the impact of the fact that you got a good price on this fiber fill junk whatever it is right okay okay good so I got my price variance let's go ahead and let's see if I can figure out my quantity variance again I'll give you these formula on the exam you can see the quantity variance formula right there and so I'm going to take my standard price my standard price is I'm just gonna write it right here my standard price is how much five dollars good so I'm gonna take that five dollars and then I'm gonna multiply it by the standard quantity minus the actual quantity now when I do these I take the ninja approach to these what happens what does they say in that movie ghost dog Have you ever seen the movie ghost dog okay you haven't seen ghost dog you gotta go check him Forrest Whitaker he's off the hook in that movie so what happens for ghost dog every time he's he's a hitman but he lives by the code of the ninja so every time he kills somebody, they put another like ninja philosophy up. Okay, so he'll put things up like, never try to take the energy from your enemy. Let the enemy use their energy against you or something. Okay, so right now this question is what is our enemy, and we're gonna let it use its energy against us, right? Do they tell me the actual quantity here? Two ten, don't they? I take the energy from the problem by doing what? Just take what it gives me. They're giving me the actual quantity, aren't they? Now all I have to figure out is what is the standard quantity. And the standard quantity is if you produce 2,000 parkas. Didn't they produce 2,000 parkas? So how many parkas did they really produce times how much of this fiber filled junk they're supposed to use per parka, which is what? Point one. So I go ahead and I take that 2,000 times the point 0.1, and that gives me this 200, doesn't it? Okay, so I put my what? I put my standard first, and when I do, I take the price, and since the standard was what? Less than the uh, actual, I have a negative $10 in here, don't I? A negative $10? And so negative is a bad thing, isn't it? So that means it's going to be 500 what? Unfavorable? Because it's negative? That's why I always put the standard first, right? So if the actual is more, I get a negative number, and that's going to add. I don't have to think anymore. I see negative. That means unfavorable, doesn't it? Okay. Now, again, with this one, what I'm doing is I'm trying to what? Just figure out what is the effect of using too much or less material, right? It's the quantity variance. So I get that difference in the standard quantity versus the actual quantity. And I multiply it times the standard price so I don't have any price static in there. It's just focusing on the quantity, isn't it? Okay, and so now we look at this and we know that, hey, this company was doing good in terms of price, not so good in terms of quantity. We've got a quantity problem, don't we? And we can start to focus in on why did we use too much material? So much more precise than that silly just looking at that one number as a variance and say, well, we didn't do good, but we don't know exactly why. Was it that we used too much gas or was the price wrong? Well, this would tell us the price was okay, but the quantity was off, right? And we could start to dig into, well, why is that happening? Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, I don't know if you need this. But just in case, positive is what? Is favorable, is happy, and what? Negative is sad, if you want to do it that way. But then the problem is the U looks like a smile. and So never mind. Just remember, what? Positive is favorable, negative is 
unfavorable. Okay, good. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and you start to take a look at the answer here only, guys. 21 favorable and 50 what? Unfavorable. This is just checking our work. And I'm putting this slide up also to tell you, do not do it any way the book tells you. Anything that the book shows you is the way to anal analyze this. Ignore it. Only do it the way I'm telling you. When you look at your homework problems, the solution is down there, and they have all kinds of whacked out ways of doing it that will do nothing but put you into misery. I'm telling you, set up the formula this way. In fact, they'll be set up for you on the test. You practice using the formula the way I've set them up. You always get the right answer. If you don't do it this way and you start trying to look at the way the book's doing it, you're going to start asking me questions like, well, John, I thought you said negative was unfavorable. Well, it is. Well, in the book, they're showing positive, and that's unfavorable. Well, that's because the book is doing it wrong. They're doing it in a manner that's not consistent. Remember, guys, I've been teaching the CPA exam for over 20 years, 22, 23 years, and my whole focus is what is the best way for you to do a problem so you get the correct answer quickly? This is the way for these questions, okay? Okay, now you come over and you take a look at this little zippy. Oh, I love this part. So we know we have a what? We have a favorable price variance and an unfavorable quantity variance. And so we are going to go to this guy who's responsible for making sure we don't use too much stuff. And what does he say? He says, well, I used too much stuff because the materials were too cheap. And then she says, no, you moved, uh, your, your scheduling is so bad that it, uh, sometimes I have to order the supplies at the last minute and I can't get the best price, et cetera, right? So they just pointed the finger at each other. So did we solve anything? Yes, we did. We can sit here and we can say, okay, his name's Charlie, her name's Mabel. Okay, we can sit here and we'll say, okay, Mabel, go ahead and... Uh, you know, buy a little better supplies, that's okay. And let's see how Charlie does with the better supplies, right? So Mabel buys some better, more expensive supplies, and we still have a quantity problem. Then we're going to tell Charlie, hey, get it together, man, right? Okay, it's not the supplies because she bought uh, better supplies, and you still had a quantity problem. So we're getting closer to getting to what the problem is so that we can eventually improve our operations, right? And Charlie will say, okay, I better quit hiding behind that excuse. Hey, let's schedule our time better, whatever the heck it is. It's causing them to use too much quantity, right? Okay, and if Charlie's smart, he'll really focus on getting that quantity situation squared away, right? Okay. Okay. Now you come over and you take a look at this example uh, with the zippies now. And um, when we look at the uh, zippies, by the way, before we get into the zippy thing, going back to these characters, um, in audit, when you do an audit, you will do these type of variance analysis. Can you think of something that um, a good price variance but a poor quantity variance might alert an auditor to? The price variance looks good, right? So they're getting a good price for this stuff. But the quantity variance looks off. They're using too much, aren't they? What could be a cause of them using too much? Huh? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Theft, right? Maybe the guys are taking too much gear. They're going to Rotten Robbie, but they're sitting there and they're filling up their tank. They're using too much stuff, aren't they? And so an auditor could start to look more closely at that particular element to see if maybe there's some theft, fraud, waste, and abuse going on, right? Okay. Yeah, so even uh, those outside the company can use this sort of analysis to help, okay, to help you know cast the right light on things okay good so let's take a look at this one and we have the following direct material standard the standard is 1.5 pounds per zippy at four dollars per pound the actual is 1700 pounds of materials were used to purchase and use to make a thousand zippies and the material costs six thousand six hundred and thirty 
so which one do you want me to do first price or quantity price okay if it's going to be price i'm going to do what and just looking at the formula i'm going to take the actual quantity I'm just going to write it here actual quantity and it's going to be what standard price minus the actual price good and that's going to be my price variance so do i know the actual quantity they used actual quantity is what no, actual quantity is 1,700 pounds. We're seeing how many pounds we use to make these zippies, right? So we use 1,700 pounds. That's the actual quantity. The standard price, they tell me, is what? $4. They give me that using the Ninja approach. I just take it. And now I have to calculate what was the actual price, don't I? Well, they spent what? 6630 and they spent 6630 purchasing what 1700 pounds so if i take the 6630 and i divide that by 1700 that gives me how much huh three dollars and ninety cents per pound okay so my actual price was 390 my standard price was four dollars and I purchased 1,700 pounds of this stuff, so there's a what? Positive 10 cent differential. So I have what? A positive $170 difference. And if it's positive, that means it is favorable. Good. Okay, we got quantity out of the way. How about, I mean, excuse me, uh, price. That was price. Let me write price. that was price how about quantity we'll put quantity down here quantity is going to be what standard price and it's going to be standard quantity minus the actual quantity good what's my standard price four dollars my actual quantity using the ninja approach they told me is what 1700 pounds the standard quantity is if you produce a thousand zippies whatever the heck a zippy is a thousand zippies and you're supposed to use what 1.5 pound per zippy so you take that thousand times the 1.5 that gives me what 1500 here okay so 1500 That's 1,500 minus 1,700 is what? Uh, negative 200. I used too much, didn't I? $4 times a negative 200 is going to give me negative 800, I guess. Negative 800, which makes it what? Unfavorable, right? Okay, so I've got my 170 favorable price variance, my, it was a positive number, my negative 800 quantity variance means it is what? Unfavorable. Right? Do not do it the way they do it. They're putting, for some reason, the actual first, and then you get a positive number, and you have to ask yourself, is that favorable or unfavorable? I don't know. If you put the standard first, then you automatically know if the number is negative, it is what? It is unfavorable. If the number is, po if the number is positive, it is favorable, right? Okay, good. So we got our materials out of the way. Let's do our labor. Materials, labor, overhead is where we're going with this, right? Okay. Now, if you've been missing class and, you know, you didn't do well on the uh, midterm, you know, so you didn't get a good grade on the midterm, you didn't get a good grade 
on the second midterm. You didn't do good on either midterm. Then you start missing class. And then you come to class and you start getting into rapid eye movement. That means to me that you really have decided, hey, you know, I'm not set up for this thing. Okay. And so there's no reason to come here and, you know, try to waste your time. Right? Okay. So I'm not quite getting it. I'm not quite getting it why a person doesn't do well on the test, doesn't come to class, leaves early on days because, you know, I got a party to go to or something, and then comes to class and falls asleep. I'm not getting it. Okay. So you come over, and we're going to do what? Now we're going to do labor. Okay, and when we do the labor, we're going to have what? We're going to do rate, and we're going to do efficiency. Okay, now rate is like price, isn't it? And efficiency is like quantity. How much did we pay our employees? How many hours did they have to work? Okay. So when you do the rate variance, it's going to be what? It's going to be the, um, the actual hours, and we're going to multiply that by the what? Standard first, standard rate minus the actual rate. Okay, that's going to give us our rate variance for our labor. Okay, when we do the efficiency variance, efficiency variance is going to be the standard rate. How much are we supposed to pay our employees? Versus what? The standard goes first. Standard hours minus the actual hours. Okay. Now, again, we go ahead and we use the actual hours because we're trying to multiply out the effect of the fact that we paid our employees a different rate than we were supposed to, right? And what? We're using the standard rate for our efficiency, so we're only measuring the effect of the fact that we use more or less hours than we were supposed to, right? Same logic as we said for the price and the quantity variance. Now, when you look at the rate variance, it's a little bit funny because you sit there and say, well, how would you possibly pay the employees more than you're supposed to? I mean, they're hired for so much. How do you end up paying them more than you were supposed to? What do you think? Huh? Well, huh? How do you end up paying an employee more than you hired them for? You hired them for $12 an hour and you start paying them $12.50 an hour. How does that happen? Huh? Yeah, overtime. So we're probably doing what? We're probably using up a bunch of overtime. Now, if we built overtime into our budget and we start having, what, a favorable rate variance, that means that we, what, we did not incur a lot of overtime, which is good, right? Okay. So sometimes students will say, well, how does the rate vary? I mean, don't you just pay people what you pay them? It's really measuring the impact of overtime. Okay. Now, you sit here and uh, you look at this one now for the parkas again, but now it's labor, and they're supposed to spend... 1.2 hours per parka, and they're supposed to pay $10 per hour, right? Okay. Now, we look, and they tell us last month they actually worked 2,500 hours, and uh, they paid $26,250 in the production of the 2,000 parkas. Okay. So let's do the rate variance first. I'll put the rate variance up here. What's the actual hours? Actual hours are 2,500. Good. Okay. What's the standard rate? $10 is the standard rate. Good. What's the actual rate? And we have to do a little math for that, don't we? 
we paid $26,250 in salary and we're dividing that now by what? We actually worked how many hours? 2,500 hours. So that comes out to how much per hour? 10 what? 10 what? Ten dollars and fifty cents. Okay, good. Ten fifty. Okay, good. So that's ten fifty. So we have what? We have twenty five hundred times a negative fifty, don't we? Twenty five hundred times a negative fifty is negative twelve fifty. And since it's negative, that means it is unfavorable, right? And it should be unfair. We paid too much. We must have incurred too much overtime, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's do the efficiency variance. And when we do the efficiency variance, we're going to use the standard rate, which is what? $10. And we're going to multiply that by the standard hours minus the actual hours I'm going to use the ninja approach they give me the actual hours don't they so I stick in that 2500 and now I've got to figure out what is the standard hours well if you produce 2000 parkas and you're supposed to spend what 1.2 per parka then you should have only ended up using what 2400 hours you used too many hours didn't you okay so ten dollars times the what negative 100 is that negative 100 gives me negative thousand and since it's negative it is what unfavorable and it makes sense that it's unfavorable I'm occurring overtime I'm probably spending too much time too right so it shouldn't shock me that those both move in the same direction Okay, all right, so we look at this one just to check our work. Do not do it the way they do it. Don't worry about all that calculation. I'm just checking my math, right? 1, 2, 5, 0, oh, unfavorable, 1,000, unfavorable. Just checking my work here. Okay, okay, good. And here's going to come again. I'm not responsible for an unfavorable labor efficiency variance. You purchased cheap materials, so it took more time to process it. Well, he's, chucked, he's stuck on that cheap material thing, right? But he could be right, right? And then uh, it took more time to process the materials because the maintenance department has poorly maintained equipment, and the equipment's crushing up good product. She could be right. So maybe we'll start out with what? Having her get better materials, if things go better, then maybe, what's I say this guy's name is? Charlie, Charlie Phil, whatever is right. And what? And then if uh, it doesn't improve, then maybe Mabel's got a good point and they should go ahead, whatever her name is. Maybe they should go ahead and do what? Start maintaining the equipment better. Okay? Okay, good. Then you come over and let's take a look at the zippy example now and you want to do price uh, rate or efficiency first you want to do rate okay good so let's go ahead if we're going to do rate it's going to be the what actual hours and we're going to multiply that by standard rate minus the actual rate put that standard in there first right okay so we have actual hours here and they spent what 1550 direct labor hours so that's 1550 the standard rate is 12 bucks per hour I don't know I think they need a better union $12 per hour come on now okay but $12 per hour is the standard rate what's the actual rate well they spent what 18,910 and they worked how many hours? 1550. Good. So that gives me 1550. That gives me, you say, $12.20 per hour. Okay. So they're paying $12.20 per hour.
that means I'm going to have 1550 times a negative what? Negative 20 cents, which is going to give me a negative. Say it again. 310. That's 20 cents, not $20, right? Okay, so that's going to give me a negative 310. And if it's negative, it is unfavorable. Good. Okay, let's do, if that's the rate, let's do efficiency, right? That's rate. I'll put rate up there. Sorry, this thing. Let's do efficiency. Okay, so efficiency is going to be what? Standard rate. And we're going to multiply it by the standard hours minus the actual hours. Good, guys. Okay, so let's go ahead and the standard rate is $12. And um, the um, $12. The actual hours, just using the ninja approach, was what? $15.50. Good. The... 1550. The standard hours for what? For a thousand zippies times what? Times 1.5 per zippy. Like I heard somebody say we should have used 1500 here instead of the 1550. So now we've got, let me just write it over here, um, $12 times a difference of what 50 negative 50 so that's going to give me a negative 600 efficiency uh-huh Uh, they tend to go hand in hand it doesn't have to be but to me if you start spending too many hours and you're probably incurring overtime so I would tend to see expect to see both an unfavorable efficiency and an, an unfavorable um, um, rate okay but um, doesn't have to be but I would think that would be common depends on how how careful we were in including overtime in our analysis right if we included overtime in our analysis to, uh, in our original development of the budget then i guess you could see a difference between the movement of the rate and the efficiency variance but overtime is not something we usually budget for unless we know we've got something special going on that's going to cause us to incur overtime so if we have sort of normal operations and then we start getting an unfavorable efficiency variance, I would think an unfavorable rate variance will follow because we usually would budget for full-time work of our employees. And if we're paying them more than their full-time wage, we probably paid them overtime, right? Okay. Or maybe somebody hired their brother-in-law. If we get an unfavorable rate variance, right? I mean, this guy is only supposed to be making $12 an hour, but they're paying him $15 an hour, right? And then we go a little bit further, and we find out that actually there is no brother-in-law. There's a fictitious employee that's making this. So you could start to what really unravel some you know, intentional uh, activity fraud in here, right? That can start to come out of some of these analysis. I was uh, I did a presentation in front of the Association of Governmental Accountants last Tuesday, and um, they had some people from BART there, and the representative from BART was you know Barrier Rapid Transit. You guys know it, BART. I don't mean BART Simpson, right? BART Barrier Rapid Transit. The representative from BART was there. And he was saying, look, we have the problem that we just look at our variance from budget and we don't sit there and break it into price and into uh, quantity parts. 
Uh, so he was complaining that Bart's budget for him was not informative enough. And the reason he was asking that is I was going over standards for internal control in the federal government. And I was pointing out to them that standards for internal control in the federal government um, will tell you what sort of analysis you might do to have better internal control. And in one of those standards in terms of assessing risk for an entity, they are to prepare variances from the budget. And the standards advise that. And so I was making the point to him that this is criteria that you can use. You can go back to BARD and you can say, look, the standards for internal control in the federal government say that we should be coming up with variances, and they give examples as to how detailed those variances could be, so we should be doing this sort of thing. The only problem that they have in that little story is that the standards for internal control in the federal government aren't applicable to BART. So, you know, if you're going to try to push an entity towards a more um, robust analysis, that sort of thing, your first step would be to find criteria that you can use that will say, look, this is sort of the way things are done. Okay, and you could use standards for internal controls. Uh, he could probably use entity enterprise risk management standards. I think have something very similar that I probably should have told him that he could have used. But um, anyway, so um, you know these these uh, very these analysis can be very telling. Bottom line. Okay. All right. Good. Let's go ahead then and just check our work. Three ten unfavorable for the rate, and we had what? We had 600 unfavorable uh, for the efficiency. Okay? All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's do overhead. Now, when we do the overhead, guys, it's going to feel very similar to what we have already done for our labor. Okay? So, we are going to take for the rate variance... And for the rate variance, we're going to have what? Our actual, and I'm putting actual hours, but underneath that I'm putting driver. Remember, guys, with overhead, it doesn't have to be labor hours. It can be whatever the driver is. Could be machine hours, couldn't it? We have a highly automated process. Could be whatever the electricity kilowatt hours used so whatever the actual driver is okay whatever the driver is but i'm going to assume hours here most of our questions it'll be hours so it's actual hours and that's going to be multiplied by the what standard rate minus the actual rate good and if we're talking efficiency okay and this is our overhead now if we're talking efficiency, it's going to be what? Standard rate, and we're going to multiply that by the standard. Again, we're using hours here, but it could be what? Whatever the driver is, minus the what? Actual, again, we're using hours, but it could be whatever the driver is. If we have a highly automated system, then it's going to be what? machine hours. If we have a labor intensive process, it's going to be labor hours like we're going to see in this problem. Okay. All right. So we go ahead and they tell me that it's 1.2 standard labor hours per parka. And the what? The main thing that changes here is the rate. Instead of it being $10 or whatever it was for labor, it is now $4 for our overhead, right? Remember our overhead rates? Okay, and so what happens? We want to do, uh, you want to do rate first? So when we do rate, it's going to be the actual hours. They worked what? 2,500 hours. It's going to be the what? Standard rate, which is $4 for our overhead, minus the actual rate. And the actual rate is how much did they spend on overhead? How much did they spend on overhead? 10500 And we're going to divide that by what? By the actual hours of 2500 What would you get? 
Okay, good. So we've got 4.2, so we take the 2,500 hours times the negative 20 cents, and that's going to give us, huh? Negative what? Negative 500. And since it's negative, it is unfavorable. Good. Let's do the efficiency. And I'm just going to steal this little space right here. Efficiency is going to be standard rate is $4. Standard uh, hours, I'll wait till I get to that. The actual hours are 2500 And we already know from doing our labor analysis that we're supposed to spend what? 1.2 times the 2,000 parkas right here. So 1.2 times 2,000 is 2,400. So we take that $4 times the negative 100 is going to give us a negative 400, meaning it is unfavorable. See, so these start to get fun after a while, don't they? You like football, don't you? Invite people over to your house to watch a football game? Make them do like five, six of these before they can watch the game. Okay. All right, let's try the zippies. Who wants to set this up for me? Who wants to tell me which one they want to do first? You want to do rate or you want to do efficiency? Go ahead, set it up for me. You want rate? We'll do rate. Okay, so you're picking up the actual hours here, right? Actual hours are 15.50, you say? Yeah. Okay, good. Then you're going to multiply that by the standard rate of three dollars we put the standard first there's my standard rate of three dollars right yeah. minus the minus uh, in other words the actual rate <laughs> so you're gonna take what you're gonna take this five thousand one one five 5,115, I say, and you're going to divide that by the 1550 hours? Yep. And you get $3.30. 330? Yes. Okay, good. And so f just bringing the calculation down here where we have some room, 1550 times a negative 30 cents, right, yeah. is going to give us a negative... 465 since it's negative it's unfavorable right good good job okay who wants to do the uh, you want to do the you want to do the efficiency too or somebody else want to do the efficiency okay okay standard rate is three dollars so we'll pick that up good We're going to use the ninja approach, and so we're going to pick up that 1550. Good. And then you just need to get me the standard hours, which is what? The thousand zippies, right? Times what? 1.5 per zippy, right? Times the 1.5 per zippy? Okay, right there. And so that's going to give me 1500, you say? Okay, so 1500 in there, and so not right, don't put the parentheses there, John, put it there, right? And this is the standard hours minus the actual hours here? Yeah, and it equals negative 150. So I'm going to take the $3 times the negative, what, 50? And that's going to give me a negative 150 and it is what unfavorable okay good if someone wants to tell me out the break how to turn off the pen from changing the page there's got to be a way to do that
I'll give you a bag of zippies. Okay. All right. Okay. Is that the right answer? Okay. Now, an important but subtle point. Okay. When we do our materials variances, we have to distinguish between the amount of materials purchased versus the amount of materials used, right? Because the amount you purchase could be different than the amount you use, couldn't it? Let's say you're trying to bake a cake. Do they use flour to bake cakes? Okay. So what happens? You go and you buy some flour, right? Do you use the whole bag of flour? You don't have to, right? So what happens? You might buy more than you actually use, right? With me so far? So if we're talking about the price variance, then you have to look at the amount that you actually purchased. If you're looking at the quantity variance, you have to focus on what you actually used, right? Price purchased, quantity used. Price, you use what you purchased. Quantity, you use, you use what you used in the calculation, right? Okay. So let's just go ahead and let's see what happens if we look at those uh, materials variances again. And notice this time that they did what? They purchased 210, but they used what? 200, right? So to get the price variance, we're going to sit there and we're going to take the what? The actual quantity, and it's now the actual quantity what? Actual quantity purchased, isn't it? Of 210. And it's going to be the standard price of $5 minus the what? Minus the actual price, which is the 1029 Divided by what? Divided by the uh, 210 that they purchased. And so that gives me what? That was 490, wasn't it? 490. And we sit here and we get this uh, 210 again times the neg uh, times the not negative times the 10 cents gives me 21 dollars favorable. Okay. Now I want to do the quantity. But when I do the quantity, it's going to be the quantity used, isn't it? Okay, so I sit here and I pick up the standard price is $5. The actual quantity used is what? 200. And the standard quantity for what? 2,000 parkas? 2,000 parkas times what? 0.1? Is 200. So when we look at it that way, they were perfect, weren't they? It's zero. People say, well, is that favorable or unfavorable? Neither. It is zero. When we calculate favorable versus unfavorable, it's from the budget, isn't it? And if it's zero, that means we exactly hit the budget. That's neither favorable nor non-favorable. So just remember, the takeaway from this is what? If you're doing price, it is going to be the amount purchased. If you're doing the quantity variance, it is the amount used. Okay? Question? Okay, good. Now, a couple of things, then we're going to take the break. But advantages, I think we've been talking about. It'll allow us to focus more closely on our operations, try to understand ways to improve the operations, etc. Right? We've been talking a lot about that. How about disadvantages? Information can be outdated, could result in dysfunctional decisions. In other words, we're sitting there and we're focusing on variances being favorable or unfavorable because we what have a favorable, say, quantity variance or efficiency variance. We didn't use as many hours. Can you think of a situation where the fact that we didn't use as many hours could be a bad situation? So even though it will be coming out as favorable, it could actually be an indication of a potential problem for us.
What if you have a uh, sales staff? Do you want them coming in at a favorable efficiency variance? You do? You have traveling sales people, traveling sales staff. You want them to be coming in at a favorable efficiency variance? I mean, if a salesperson isn't out there beating the pavement trying to churn up sales, then they're not doing their full job, are they? What's that movie where, like, uh, Alec Baldwin says, you got out there and you got to do sales, right? Sales. Right? I mean, if they're not out there beating the territory up trying to find more sales, then what? That may not be a good thing, right? We want them to be putting in that time, don't we?